You see me hit the button and everybody goes quiet, right? Good morning, Willowbrook Bible Church. Uh, we're here to worship, and we're here to focus on the kingdom of God with um, Jason Ostrander's series um, through the 22nd. And we've been learning a lot. We have been um, discussing really great things on our Zoom calls. And uh, we want to begin our worship today with um, our prayer to God to have his kingdom come. We have selected this song as an anchor song for uh, this series and uh, pray that um, it will be encouraging to you and um, help you with perspective, heavenly perspective, when things of earth are, seem very, very strong and um, may or may not be happy for you right now. And um, we pray that uh, God's kingdom would come to earth, that, um, that his will would be done. And um, so let's begin with um, singing this song um, as, a, as a prayer to him and uh, asking him to uh, show himself to be strong and powerful on the earth.
us today as we uh, learn about your kingdom and uh, find out the, uh, the things that we should be doing here, Lord, to see your kingdom on earth. We thank you for coming, for helping us, for your word, for Jason speaking this morning. We pray you'd help us to understand what your word has to say for us and how it can affect our lives for your sake and for ours too. Thank you for the congregation this morning and here and virtually, Lord. Thank you for them. Pray for safety and your loving care, provision and protection, and help us to keep our ears open this morning. We hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen.
time to allow God's peace to flow over you. Come into the tent of meeting. Come and meet God there and get that peace that we all need.
Is it good? All right. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really good to see you this morning. Uh, and it's so warm this morning. It makes it even better. Um, quick uh, snapshot recap from last week for anybody who wasn't here. Last week, Jason gave his introduction to this series about the kingdom of God. And he gave a snapshot of... Uh, he described the Beatitudes as being a, a new job description for the disciples. And I appreciated that because I had never thought about the Beatitudes being a job description for the disciples. And for us, as we move forward and interact with people throughout our week, how we can step into God's kingdom that can be in front of us. So God's kingdom is in front of us and not just something we can look forward to uh, when we pass in heaven. We can step right into it right now. And uh, I was thinking about that, and then I was thinking about, I was like, hmm, so like, if that was a job description for the disciples, it's a job description for us, who are people that I've known in my life who have lived out that job description, and who have been really good uh, uh, testimony to me, uh, and have, who have encouraged me. Uh, so I was thinking about people in my life, um, and... I'll give a, there's a lot of people, but uh, just to connect with what we started last week, too, about thinking about unity and how we can encourage other during this time. Uh, so I would like to, I'll give a shout out to Meg. Um, and uh, I'll have a, I have a little story to tell you about how Meg has lived out that job description. And then I was going to offer it up to anybody else if they would like to share. If they have somebody that comes to their mind, they can share that, too. So. My mom passed away two months ago, and leading up to the service, I'm really bad at asking for help to do things. Uh, but people are like, what can I do? And so Meg's like, what can I do to help you to prepare? And I'm like, well, uh, I guess you can like pray. That's always a really good thing. So Meg um, came early to the space, to the church before my mom's service, and she prayed for individual people, and she prayed for the actual like space. and. Uh, I ended up asking her to pray for really specific things for certain people, and that was hard for me to ask her to do because some of those people were people that I knew were coming from my work, from my, from my job, and some of those people I like, and some of those people I might still hold grudges against, but I knew that the Lord wanted to speak to them somehow. So I gave those names to Meg because um, she was like, she was like, I'll pray for anybody, and I know she likes to pray specifically, and so she encouraged me and challenged me to step into the kingdom that way by just asking her to pray for people specifically. Um, so I'm wondering, does anybody else just have a, a person's name? It doesn't have to be somebody here, or just somebody that comes to mind as somebody who has challenged you or encouraged you to step into the kingdom. Sometimes it can be... There can be so many people who influence in different different ways and challenging ways. You got somebody, Meg? Yeah. Um, I tease sometimes that the reason I married Dave was to get his mother as my mom. <laughs> she was a remarkable woman who invested a lot of time in me and taught me a lot about prayer and intercession. She was definitely a worship warrior, and she taught me how to educate, pray specifically for people and, and things, and she was just, she was a great encouragement for me. And she's not with us anymore, but She's one of the people that, that, as you said with one of your servants, mm -hmm. picked us up and woke cool. us up. And I just wanted to mention her. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have somebody they would like to honor or commemorate? Did you, also, there's, did you say honor? Yeah, I said honor. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we, uh, you guys remember Luke Wideman. I remember, um, 
And he's just a good guy, you know, just strong testimony and uh, very practical guy. I remember once, if I can tell a story, a woman was having water in her basement and uh, so they regraded the house so the water wouldn't come in. And she said, well, I'm going to pray that there's no water in the basement. He said, you don't have to pray about that. We've already leveled the ground. And he loved the Lord, but he's very practical in that sense. And he was a, a prayer guy for me. We did um, DE here along with Dave Dunby. Not probably none of you know, but um, he's a good guy. And he's gone, he's gone too, but very powerful testimony of his time in the um, Navy, um, being persecuted for his faith. And, uh, but a great guy, so I really loved him. And uh, uh, sad to see him gone, but uh, I know he's having a good time with the Lord. So. Thanks, Bob. Um, anybody else? I'll also at the same time uh, open this up to uh, any prayer requests or praises we have for this week. We like to connect with each other by sharing uh, prayer requests or things that are happening in our lives. So, uh huh. And I just want to thank everybody for their prayers this past almost two weeks when I was so sick. And I am I am here. I am better. I'm getting stronger every day. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to the bottom of it. It's going to take some time. So thank you. I want to thank the Lord for some encouragement this morning. I don't know why my friend from Seattle reached out at probably what was 5.30 in the morning for her, um, but she asked me how I was doing, and um, that I don't know why she asked that, and I said, I'll connect with you later. Um, I'm headed off to worship, and she said, I'll be praying for you. I'm like, wow, you know, that's, that's really cool. I didn't have anything specific to ask her about and I was really almost out the door but thank the Lord for people who listen to what the Lord says and then just send something out which kind of goes along with what this new project is about encouraging one another um, I think we're supposed to um, not stomp out the, the fire or you know that kind of stuff we're supposed to encourage that and blow on anything that um, we see a little fire going, let's blow on it, let's encourage it, let's fan it into full flame. And um, so I'm hoping that we can really lean into that a little bit. I know that for myself, uh, this past week, uh, I feel like Tuesday to Thursday was just like sucked away with like such election anxiety. Um, and it was interesting because we're talking about stepping into the kingdom and then my mind is like sucked away with like all this political craziness. So I'll just generally pray for that for all of us. I'm thankful for uh, Kensington yesterday for everybody who, you know, made it possible with the meatballs and all that that night. He did for Carl and Rachel who put it together. And uh, we just went down with Carl and Elise, and it was just such a blessing. I haven't been there since the beginning of 2020, I think, was when we stopped. So go down and you know, just hand out food and, and bless the people down there. That was really special. Mm -hmm. yeah. On the back of that, could you drop the crock pot off? Um, <laughs> the guys who watched it, the crock pot off.
Anybody else? Can I just add my uncle Bill is not doing well in Idaho. He's in the hospital with COVID. Father, thank you for the bright sunshine and the warmth today. Um, it was very encouraging and just as encouraging to see all of us together here, uh, encouraging one another and supporting one another. Um, and how this is this is the space where we, we meet you um, and hear from you. Uh, and Father, I just want to confess that this past week um, we have gotten sucked away um, probably having doubts and not having full trust in you and uh, the election has been a big part of uh, bringing worries to our minds uh, but so we confess that and just please remind us again and again of how you have all of us uh, in your hand and that ultimately you are Lord um, and that we do not um, have to fear um, the political situation in our country, but you have, you have it under control. Um, I have uh, things to praise you about May this past week, feeling better, but we still lift her and ask for continued healing. And even though she's um, juggling uh, a, new, a new course of treatment, uh, just give her patience um, and continue healing. Uh, and we thank you for all the ways that um, you have put other people, uh, put us on other people's mind. And for whatever reason, that person reaches out. So I thank you for friends that do that, like Kim's friend. Uh, he reached out to her this morning. And I just ask that you would continue to have uh, amongst each other, amongst us, uh, continue to lift each other up. And, encouragement. Um, I also um, thank you for the opportunity we have to travel to Kensington in order to serve. Um, I thank you for all the ways that um, we have come together this most recent time. It was a huge encouragement to me to see people come together and volunteer again to serve in Kensington and to hand out a meal. Um, even though with COVID it might be a little uncertain, not really sure what we're stepping into, but I'm so thankful um, that we did take that step uh, together. Um, I also lift up uh, Andrea and Greg. Um, your love, your love casts out fear, and I ask that they would know that in a new and really real way. Um, and and grief um, can lay heavy. Um, I just ask that you would uh, speak to them uh, through Greg's uh, family situation. Um, I ask that you be with him and his family. Um, I ask that even though he he might not feeling might not be feeling 100% again, I ask that you would um, just heal him and have him start to feel better so that he can spend time with his family. Um, and just Andrea. Um, Again, with the fear, she knows she knows that you are her provider, that you can cast out that fear. But I ask that she would take a new and personal step um, in her journey with you to know you better. Um, and I also pray for uh, Uncle Bill uh, and his um, illness with COVID. I ask for wisdom for doctors, and I just ask in Jesus' name that you would just cast out any illness in him, and that he would be able to um, go home. Um, and that he would know that you did that for him. Um, and I just ask that you would, um, in new ways this week, uh, as we go through each doorway, um, as we interact with each person, that we would be able to see uh, your kingdom and to step into that. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.
morning, everybody. Uh, with your permission, we're going to start a little bit differently this morning. Um, this is something that I, I uh, often do when I'm speaking at different locations. And it can be at first a little bit like, whoa, that's different. But after a while, you get used to a rhythm of it. And that is praying to receive something from the Lord before receiving something from the Lord, right? Like, you know, kind of opening up yourself to, as Bob said earlier, opening up our ears. And there's something to have it prayed over you, right? And to know that that's really what we want to be able to do. That's why we're here, right? I mean, this is not just a social club. Um, it's a social club with uh, added benefits. Uh, hearing from the creator of the universe is definitely one of them. <laughs> and so for us to be able to lean into that and request it of ourselves, I feel like is something we've been asked to do, you know, as, as Christians, as believers. But I want to share with you a passage real quickly in 1 John chapter 5. If you can go there, it's a, it's a passage of scripture that really changed my understanding of what prayer is. And for the longest time, like many of you, I grew up thinking that prayer was something that you did, you know, prior to eating a meal. Um, maybe in the waning moments of the evening before you drift off into sleep, you're throwing up a couple of arrows, hoping that God's listening in those spaces. And while those are not uh, illegal in the prayer world, it doesn't ever match this understanding that I feel like Paul puts out there, right? Like, what does Paul say about prayer? You should pray without ever stopping, right? So that does not equate to a really good prayer before dinner and lunch and a really good prayer before I go to bed. Those aren't equal. So either Paul is a lunatic and has no idea that I have to live my life. I can't just close my eyes while I'm driving. I can't just always be praying. I have to, like, do things in this life. Well, maybe my thought on what prayer is is a skew. Maybe what Paul was able to figure out is something that we are all called into, but we, you know, don't go there. One of the things you don't like to be told when you're writing a paper in school is that you have written a run-on sentence. A run-on sentence is a sentence that really has no ending, and actually just put a period on it and put some pronouns in there so we can end this thing, right? And write it the correct way. But I would encourage you all to have a prayer life that is a run-on sentence with God. That just doesn't find an end, there's no period to it, it just kind of continues to rumble in and roll with you. You pray in a space where there is no, I'll talk to you more about this later, but that it's just a continual conversation. John 5, beginning in, uh, 1 John 5, excuse me, beginning in verse 14, says this. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life that I don't feel very confident. I hope he's there. I hope it's working. I got my fingers crossed that I picked the right faith. I mean, there's times like that in my life, and there's other times where you're bold, right? You're, you're in that space, and maybe I often see it because I speak at a lot of weekend retreats. I see it on a Saturday night. I see kids out there professing things and confessing things that like but 24 hours ago, they couldn't even imagine doing why because they had a bold confidence in God. They were right with him in that sense. But we're called to have this life, by the way, all the time, not just Saturday night at camp, right? But we can have the confidence and this is how you get it. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now there's another sentence to this though, by the way, and it's this. And if we know that he hears us, so if God hears us, whatever we ask for, we know we'll have it. Now that sounds like prosperity gospel through and through, right? I mean, it just sounds like just ask for it, name it, and claim it, and it's yours, right? But there is something in this, though, a little bit of a, a catch. And that is this. If you want to have whatever you ask for, you have to ask for things according to God's will. And not mine. This is a huge challenge for us in our prayer life. We're in that space of, wait, I don't know, is this God's will or is this my will? This seems like a good idea to pray cancer out of this body, but why isn't it leaving? See, the double-edged sword of the will of God is this. It says that if you ask for anything according to his will, he hears it. So the other edge of that sword is, if you ask for things that are not according to his will, he's deaf to it. He doesn't hear it. If I just shoot up my will and all the things that I want into the sky, there's a chance that those arrows are going right by and he's not even hearing it. You know why? Because it's not in accordance to his will. He can only hear his will. He cannot hear mine. He cannot entertain my will. He can know it and understand it, but when I'm praying for things, I have to seek out his will. The only thing he wants to be surrounded by is his understanding, his will. 
So you should say, then, what is the will of God? Well, we have a lot of it right here in this book. So that stands to reason that to the level of understanding and knowledge we have of the Word of God sometimes equates to our level of understanding of God's will. See, you and I could have great wills. We could have really excellent wills, right? Wills that are full or desires that are full of passion and, 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 and energy. We could be looking at the Beatitudes and saying, I want all those things, right? And we're asking, and maybe you've been in those spaces that you've asked for things for lengths of time, and you've heard nothing or nothing has been given to you or granted to you. We have to check ourselves. Have I been asking for things according to God's will or mine? And the reason this is such a beautiful passage is because it is so full of prosperity. It is so full of joy and overwhelming. God has storehouses of grace. He has storehouses of righteousness, storehouses of mercy, that he literally just wants to rip open and let it fall all over who you are. But the accessibility of those things does not come by way of my own best intentions and my own best meaning. It comes by giving my life over to the will of God and putting my will at the doorstep. So, here's what we're going to pray this morning. And we're going to do it this way. If you feel so confident and so bold, I would encourage you just to turn to the people that are around you and just pray this over them out loud. Right? I ask him to play because sometimes we need a little background noise when we speak out loud at church and pray out loud. Um, everybody's going to pray at the same time. It's fine. But I want you to ask for something very specifically over your children, over your friends, over your cousins. I want you to pray that they would see the will of God in their life today. That they would see it. That they would step into that kingdom. That it would be known to be theirs. And then be known to be acted upon. So can we do that? Just for a minute. And uh, I'll sit down here and just cuddle up, <laughs> turn around, jump, pray for Carl. I mean, just, you know, however we can do it, let's make sure we just pray over each other and just pray again. Pray for the will of God to be evident in each other's lives. Go ahead. Father, we ask for your will to be done. Your kingdom come and be on earth right now, just as it is in heaven. I imagine the, the majesty of your heaven here in our lives that we don't just simply get to watch it as if it was a movie on the screen, but that we get to enter it 
that it would do something in us and for us. Bless your word today, God. May we be surrounded by your will, be comforted in that, and be bold because of it. In your name, amen. Thanks, Kim. Probably should just have you keep playing the whole time. <laughs> well, as far as I can tell, the election is over. As best I can tell. And when thinking about this, and you know, you mentioned the anxiety that comes from the, uh, the outpouring of information continually and not knowing what to do with things like that. And on my run this morning, I was thinking, what would Jesus say if somebody asked him, why did X candidate get elected? Why did X candidate not get elected? Things like that. You know, I wonder how he would respond. And I, I think I can almost guarantee you what he would say, to be honest. And I'm not making words up for him. I'm just looking at other portions of scripture in which people came and asked him very prominent, particular, in-the-moment questions to see what his response would be. Because this is how we learn. This is how we grow. And I have to imagine that his response would be very similar to what it was to the, remember the John 9 conversation with the blind man. And his disciples, when they asked him, why is he blind? Is it because he was a sinner or because his parents were sinners? And Jesus' response was, no, neither. The reason he's blind is so that the work of God may be on display in his life. Amen. The reason so-and-so got elected or so-and-so didn't get elected is a level of anxiety. But a greater understanding of that, Jesus would say, the reason that... Biden was elected, was that so the work of God may be on display in our lives? Or the reason that somebody wasn't elected is not because of the campaign that they should have run or the way that they should have acted or maybe not have been so corrosive. No, he would say, oh, the reason that Trump didn't get elected is so the work of God may be on display in our lives. See, the reality of this world is limited. <laughs> the scope of this world is narrow. But the kingdom of heaven can be placed over all of those things. The kingdom of God can be front and center in everything. The situation just has to rise above. And it's, it should be no surprise then to any of us when, when Jesus would have to deal with an understanding, taking something that is so enormous, right, and so far off, as the kingdom of heaven, where God lives, where, where the creation occurs, where galaxies are spun by his left hand. And then he's got to explain that to the commoners of us down here, walking around in this world, worrying about paying rent or filling our car with gas or worrying about elections or whatever. And we've got to be subjected to this great understanding so that when Jesus decided to try to do that, he told stories. There was no mathematical formulas. There was no analytical viewpoints. There was no gap analysis as to the difference between heaven and earth. It was, you want to know about the kingdom of God? I'm going to tell you a story. We call those parables, by the way, right? And there's a lot of parables in the, in the scriptures and all the ones we have recorded in the gospels and probably many more besides, to be honest. Because Jesus very rarely gave out a bulleted message series. Instead, what he did was he said, I can tell you about something grand, but the only way I can do it is to tell you a story about it. Now, real quickly, because we will spend all of this message in a parable, I view parables as, right, those earthly understandings of a heavenly concept and a heavenly principle. And lest you think that these are more just like over-spiritualized Aesop's fables or, or myths or something with a motto attached to the end of it, you know, that we might receive some measure of confidence. Jesus Christ was the perfect communicator. Everything he did was perfect. And if there was a better way to explain the kingdom of God, Jesus would have communicated it that way. Instead, he told some really amazing stories. So these stories that were, especially the prodigal son, this actually did not occur in real life, although I could see it playing out millions of times. But it's an expressed value, an expressed opinion, expressed knowledge given to a space that desperately needed it. 
There's a couple things that go on when there's parables. It's a, it's a storytelling. It's, it, it, like it, it, there's people listening. There's people taking mental notes, right? They're not reading in a book. They're hearing this for the first time. They're trying. So it, makes, it should make uh, total sense that when Jesus would speak in parables, he would very much speak about things that are right in front of people. He would, if you're in an agricultural area, he's going to give parables that talk about sowing seeds and farming. When he's in a space where there's a lot of uh, female workers, he's going to tell stories about cooking and yeast being folded in and things like that because it would make sense in that space for them to know that, right? So... Who are the players, so to speak, in Luke 15 when Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son? Well, it says it right at the beginning, Luke 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were muttering about this man, Jesus, who welcomes sinners. And he eats with them, dines with them, enjoys time with them. So here's our players. Jesus is going to tell some stories. Those that can hear it is a mixture of Jews, Gentiles, haves and the have-nots, the clean and the unclean. Those that, you know, feel completely disqualified from whatever God you're speaking about and those that feel overly qualified for this God that you're speaking about. So Jesus starts off this little storytelling time by telling two very quick parables one, you know them both very well. The first one is about a farmer, a herder, if you will, that has lost one sheep out of his 100. And he goes and he finds this one sheep and he brings it back and he rejoices. Right away, the Pharisees are like, oh, this is good, Jesus. I like where you're going with this. Because a lot of these sinners need to hear this. A lot of these Gentiles, they, they are the lost sheep. They are the one that is far off. How great that you are building confidence in them and letting them know that they too can come to the clean side. Jesus then tells another parable after this. He tells a parable about an old woman, a widow, has two coins that are very valuable to her, and she lost them. And in the, in the losing of them, she just rips her whole house apart, right? Everything's upside down until she reaches underneath the bed, right, and finds the two. And then she goes out and tells everybody how excited she is that she found two. And again, the Pharisees. Jesus, this is beautiful. I love what you're doing. You're just encouraging these sinners, these tax collectors, that they too can be a prized possession. Oh, glorious. Now, whether it's tongue in cheek or whether it's the irony of Jesus Christ or whether it's by virtue and demand of the Pharisees needing it, he decides to tell one more parable in this space. One that will surely encompass all that have ears to hear. Here it goes. Verse 11. There was a man, and this man had two sons. The younger one said to his father one day, Father, give me my share of the estate, my inheritance. And so the father divided his property up between them. There's three players in this parable. We have two brothers and a father. One's older, one's younger. They're not identical twins. And the father, who is a loving father apparently, decides to do exactly what the youngest son asks him to do. Give me my money now so I can go and live my life. If you saw the, the, the graphic that I made for this series title, I put the kingdom of God, and in the back there is like, I think it's probably from Colorado, a beautiful meadow of straw and a small little brown building, a barn off in the distance. I want us to have that in our mind as we're thinking through where this parable takes place because this parable has a location that's very important. There is a house in this parable. Sometimes when we read it, we get distracted because we want to know how sinful the younger brother was or how ungrateful the older brother was or how beautiful the father is. But there's a place, and actually that house is where I want us to go to. This place where this father has grown his two boys up to the age that they feel like they can do what they need to do to move on with their lives. Now, we might say asking for your inheritance early in our day and age is kind of like slapping the face. Like, listen, I don't really care if you're dead or alive. Can I get what's coming to me, right? Not necessarily so in Jesus' time, right? It was not uncommon for a father to dole out both halves of the money and give it to their children. So this, it's not a, 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 a total um, foul ball played by the younger brother because if it was, the father would have said no, but he didn't. And he, by the way, gave money to both of his sons, not just the younger one. We always kind of forget that the older brother got money as well. 
So what happens when the younger brother, now with his back pocket full of cash and a life in front of him to live? It says in verse 13, not long after that, the younger brother took everything he had and he set off for a distant country and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything he had, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So this son puts on his backpack, kicks open the screen door on the barn, says goodbye to his father, his little brother, he doesn't know where he is because he's never in the house, and he starts walking away from the house to a place that he thought he'd find something he really wanted. And when he got there, he found it. <laughs> he walked into the first restaurant that he could find in this land. He went up to the bar and he said, I want to buy everybody's food and drinks here because I got money and I want fame and I want friends and I want party. And he just did it. And quickly he became probably one of the most popular people in this location, right? Everybody went with him wherever he had. He was having fun. Everybody was engaged in him until all of a sudden money ran out. The friends ran out. And in a great irony, the land ran out. A famine began, and he was in need. Now, we often find ourselves in places of need, right? We often find ourselves in jams, if you will. But I can't imagine a jam in my life that I have been in to where I was feeding pigs, and as I'm feeding them, I long for what they are not eating. <laughs> Right? I long for, for the leftovers of pig slop. Now, all I can think in this space, in this story, in this moment, is as he's walking out there every day with the buckets and sloshing it into the trough and looking at what they won't eat and wishing he could have that, there's not much lower than that place. He's right there. He's questioning everything that he's done. He's feeling sorry for himself even sorrier that he made this decision. And in the middle of this field, he has a thought, an epiphany, a great idea. Verse 17, when he came to the, his senses, he said, wait a minute, how many of my father's hired men back where I used to live have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I know what I'll do. I'm going to go home. I'm going to set out and go back to my father. And then when I get to him and I see him, I'm going to have to explain myself. So here's what I'm going to say. He's going to say, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. Please, dad, make me one of your hired men. He had the speech ready to go. He knew he was going to have to, you know, have some recompense. He was going to have to say something to kind of smooth over the current situation that he found himself in. He was preparing his excuse. He was preparing for an eventual, hopeful welcoming back home. I love what it says there at the beginning of verse 17 when it says, he came to the end of his senses. <laughs> he came to the end of himself. Which, by the way, is where we must all get to find the Father. It's just what I said at the beginning, right? Our will, our own sensibilities pale in comparison to the will of the Father. In this space of fighting and going after it and thinking you got what you wanted and, and reveling in something for a temporary moment and then realizing that you want what pigs don't want. That's how low and how hard life has become. That moment of I am at the end of myself is when the awareness for this young man came to be. Go home. Go back to your father. Whatever pickup truck he jumped into the back of and hitchhiked home in, however long that journey was, back to the Father. Can you imagine what he was thinking? What was running through his mind? How he was going to have to take this on? Where he was the son of the Father who had servants, he's now going home to request to be considered as one of his servants. Whatever the case may be, I imagine now the, the, the bending of the field where the house sits up top. The truck drops him off puts his backpack on, and he begins that last part of the journey home to see the Father. Ah, 
But while he was still a long way off, it says in verse 20, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. Every day, the dad, in my mind, in the story, kicks open the door, looks out over the horizon to see if he might find the silhouette of his youngest son returning home. Every day he looks. Every day he's committed. Every day he is there. The door is always open, not knowing anything, perhaps, of what he's going through. Doesn't matter, it's secondary. This night, he kicks the door open as the sun's setting, and he looks, and he sees in the distance a shadow, a silhouette of a figure that he recognizes, although maybe worse for wear than before he left. And then I imagine the son looking up at the house. He looks up at the house, and all of a sudden he sees something he did not particularly think he was going to see. Some wild-eyed old man coming running down the hill as fast as his sandals will stay on his feet. It says that as he saw him, he had compassion. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. It's not, it's not what the son thought. The son was thinking and preparing to be able to like bow low and ask for forgiveness and tell him these things. He started his speech, right, in verse 22. He, he starts his speech. He says, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. But the father stopped the speech and said, I don't care about what you're going to say to me right now because I've got to get my robe out of the closet. I've got to get my ring off my finger and put it on your finger and put my sandals on your feet. That's what I've got to do. Do you see the glorious beauty of this exchange between those who are sinners and far off when they come to the Father. They don't sit there with a checklist of things and how they're going to make it right because the Father doesn't want to hear that. His economy is different than our economy. Instead, what he does is he takes somebody who squandered all of his money away and he gives them more stuff. <laughs> You're going to take this expensive ring and now this ring is yours. Here's my really expensive robe. This robe is yours. And in the middle of it all, hugging and kissing him and bringing him closer and not letting him get down on the ground and he gets just think the son's trying to get low and trying to be right. He keeps pulling them up and said, no. And then he whizzes around on his heel and he says, all right, everybody, get the party started. Because <laughs> my son who was gone, who was dead, is alive. You know why this story confounds people so much? It's because of the way that we live our lives on this planet. We are conditional. What do we do when somebody finds themselves, I'm just going to say this guy had a gambling and, and, and a drug addiction. Whatever he got into in this space, they tried to make it as bad as possible. As, as it's just like grotesque and I want pig slop. That's how bad this was. And then God, the father in this story, just overwhelms him with more things. We would call that enabling. You're an enabler. How can you enable somebody to go back into that space? In God's economy, there is no enabling. It is, he is my son. He was gone. He's home. I don't understand why there's a second question out there. It's beautiful. And then this son, who thought he was going to have to pay a penalty, is now walking around in his father's sandals. His cake dry, broken feet now feel soft. And he's overwhelmed with this. I don't deserve this. But I got it. You can see very quickly the link between this part of the story and for those of us when we accepted Jesus Christ into our lives. We took the brokenness of who we are. We dropped it at the feet of the Father. And we were giving blessing after blessing after blessing. Salvation among them. But more too than that. It's beautiful. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I once was blind and now I see. I once was dead and now I'm alive. It's beautiful. This happened to you if you made that decision. And it happened to anyone out there that made the decision to accept Christ in their life. And to the Gentiles that are sitting around trying to make the connection to what Jesus is saying... They've already made the connection that this is them, right? As soon as the young man went out and did all the stupid stuff, they were like, oh, that's us. That's us. Jesus is talking about us. Now he's going to tell us what we're going to have to do to get right with him. And you can just imagine them seeing and hearing, wait, there's nothing to do to get right. I don't have to redo my whole life. I can just walk up to you, admit that I've screwed up, and I get everything from you. And as the light bulbs are going off over their heads, and the joy is setting in to them, 
There's another group of people who are getting very upset. <laughs> are you, they, no, I have, I have been obedient. They do not just get to come up here and get rings and robes and sandals just because they want it. They've got to do stuff. They've got to get right. <laughs> but there's no time to think about that because right now there's a party going on. A massive party. A party in which the biggest calf that we have, the fattest one, go get that one, we're going to cook that thing, and we're going to invite everybody to come to this party. The father said to his servants in verse 22, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put the ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and he is found now. So they began to celebrate. The celebration, of course, is just a side note in this, but... The reality is the celebration over you when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And for that matter, every single day when you decide to follow Jesus instead of somebody else. The celebration is ruckus. It's beautiful. For the longest time in my life, that's where this parable ended. There would be somebody that would then ask, is anybody out there never experienced this type of turning to God? Stand if that's you. And they would see people accept Christ in meaningful and beautiful ways. It was probably only until I got into college and really started to consume the Bible for my own that I realized that there's a much bigger story. <laughs> Because any one of us can identify the, 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 the younger brother, the, the, the prodigal son, right? As a matter of fact, you always hear it talked about, the prodigal son. It should be the prodigal sons, too. Because we only ever think about the one that did the stuff that's bad. Obviously, Jesus has to fix that. First time I read verse 25 and beyond, I was blown away. Meanwhile, it's a great way to start the next part off. Meanwhile, so all this is going on, right? The son goes off, he comes back, he is overwhelmed by the love of the father, and he's given a party like nobody has ever seen before. Meanwhile, all this is going on. The older son was in the field working, far away from the home, way back in the back 40, whatever job he had consumed himself with that day. And as he was walking back, it says he heard music and he heard dancing. Now, my friends, if you want to throw a great party, it's one thing to hear music. But if you hear dancing, you're throwing a rager. <laughs> he heard dancing. Now, I've been over to Africa, and I've been in church services over there, and you know you can hear dancing, especially in worship. It's, oh, my gosh, it's so beautiful. He heard it. He knew what, everything that was going on. So he, he didn't know what, so why it was happening, though. He called over one of his servants. He said, hey, what's happening right now? He said, didn't you hear? Like, the servant got interrupted because he's out trying to get, like, a chicken or something. And he's coming running back in with it, you know? And he's like, hey, do you know what's going on? And he says, haven't you heard it? Your, your brother, who was who's lost, has been found. He came back. We're having a party for him right now. Verse 28. The older brother became angry. Mm. And he refused to go inside. Basically just threw a kindergarten as he fit out in the backyard. <laughs> Put his hands like this. Started making sense of what was happening. And you could just see the level of red rise. Mm -hmm. Now, inside the house... Streamers flying, things are happening. I mean, it's unbelievable, right? And, and somebody said, we need more lemonade. And so the father goes and he grabs the empty pitchers and he comes to the kitchen window and he's filling it up with water and he looks outside and he sees this. What is my older son doing out there? Maybe he doesn't know what's going on. So he leaves the party. He leaves the house, the very location that he longs to be in with his sons. He leaves that to go outside and try to have a, a rational discussion with his older brother, who's for some reason very angry, and he doesn't know why. The father went out there, he began pleading with him. Could you just see the intensity of this moment? He's pleading with him. He's not saying, hey, you want to come in? He is like begging him to just like stop whatever's going on here and come inside and see how beautiful this is. Just come see it. And then, which would have been the greatest day of the father's recent life, turns very dark. Look at how the Older brother speaks to the father now. Look. Hmm. All these years I've been slaving for you. Never disobeyed your orders. Ever. 
and you never even gave me one small goat to have a party with my friends for. <coughs> but then when this son of yours, this, this younger one who squandered, by the way, all of your money away on prostitutes and stuff like that, like he didn't give it to charity, he screwed everybody up, including himself. He comes home and you give him the biggest party we've ever seen. Where's my party? Is what he's saying. You see it? You see the ugliness of that? Those who thought, by the way, that they were inheritors of the kingdom, upset in, face of, in the face of the Father who's offering it freely, but they're so stuck and consumed with having to earn it or do it their way, their will be done, not God's. That's what's in the tension moment right now. And I can guarantee you the Pharisees were hanging on what happens next with the Father. Because as Jesus is going to pronounce the kingdom of God, he is not only pronouncing the kingdom of God over the sinners and the tax collectors and the Gentiles, which he did. He's now going to pronounce the kingdom of God over them. If ever there was a moment for a father to be like, oh, you look, you're, you're grounded. <laughs> like this was the moment, right? The act of disrespect in light of what the father longed for. But look at the father's response. How different does it start out than the son talking to the father? It's like the air is clear. Have, have you ever been in that moment where, and I have been in my life, where you just need to get something off of your chest, and like when you're done, you're like shaking because you just can't believe it all came out that fast and that loud, and maybe it was a little too coarse, you know, whatever, and you're just kind of in that moment where you're kind of like heavy breathing and trying to make sense of what just happened, and, and then to hear your father say this, my son, oh, that is so beautiful. Yeah. He could have said any other thing in that moment. He could have called him any number of things in that moment. You little, you ungrateful, you don't show no. He says, sits there with his arms just like it was for the younger brother. My son. You are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he is now alive again. He was lost and he's now found. Now come in the house and party with me because that's where I want you to be. Again, when I was younger, I read this passage, I identified with the younger son so readily. I accepted Jesus Christ when I was five. My mom, um, who's watching, uh, she prayed with me when I was five. And I, maybe many like you um, asked for God to come into my life. And, and then as I grew and I understand what that like, introductory you know, agreement was, it became larger and more profound. And there were many other waypoints in my life where I made that declaration again. One another time in ninth grade at a camp, another time at, at college actually, in a dorm room by myself after understanding this. I, I was not anymore able to identify with the younger son once I understood that there was an older brother out there and that man like a beacon, it's like, that's me. That's me. I'm the older brother. I'm in the backyard frustrated that I have to do all this stuff and seemingly everybody else out there gets to have a good time and do whatever they want. And you mean to tell me if after living their whole life of living it the way they want to, they can just walk into the presence of God and he will give them everything? That is not fair. That's not fair. Maybe it is or isn't, but I'm not the one determining fairness. I mean, I was. That's why it didn't make sense. But now I understand that there's a different kind of fairness out there. There's a kingdom of God that has a fairness that I will never understand until I'm face to face with it. There's a kingdom of God out there that accepts those who are far off. Those who can be on the cross with the very Savior and say, could you remember me today? Yes, I will remember you in paradise. What did he do to get it? He actually just crucified, luckily, alongside of the Savior of the world. <laughs> but he got it. He got it. See, what's really going on in this and how it plays into our life is this understanding of the kingdom of heaven. 
The kingdom of heaven is where God is. That's where the kingdom exists. Yes, it may be off in some palatial, beyond galaxy space that I will go to one day. I hope it's cool. I'm sure it'll be amazing. It's going to be perfect, so I mean, I'll have no complaints, right? But in that space, yes, it's there, but it is also here. It is also right in front of you. It's also sitting next to you. It's also in your car, in your bedroom, in your job location. It's there. It's wherever God is, the kingdom of heaven is near. So in this parable, because he's trying to help people directly understand the ramifications, all the father wanted was for everybody to be inside the house. <laughs> Just be in there with me. That's the thing. I don't, you don't need to go out there and do all that work. You're probably exhausted from doing all that work. Just come inside. That's where I want to be with you. Come into the house. In a world where we might make someone like the younger brother take 24 different programs to get out of whatever they're struggling with until we bear them as back in good stead. And in a world where we promote clean living, sin management as the highest virtue of Christianity, God will look at us and say, none of that matters to me. Just come into the house. That's what I want the most. This prodigal son parable is more about a reminder to me to put down the tools of my labor and be with the Lord. Whether that spent time is reading scripture or engaging in a conversation in which as I'm talking to somebody I'm seeing the kingdom of God around me or working out alongside my friends at our local CrossFit gym or whatever the case may be. How great to know the kingdom of God is near in all of those instances. This building could shut down, board it up. It affects the kingdom of God, zero. Now, what is our goal? I don't want to run past the thought and the notion that just because I'm here in church on Sunday morning, that everybody would say, I got the younger brother thing on your wraps. I did accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior. I'm good on that one. Because you might be sitting here and you're met with the reality that, like me, I knew a lot about Christianity and I surrounded myself with it my entire upbringing. But there came a point in my life where I didn't know Jesus. I knew the church. I knew how to be good. I knew how to be a great Christian. But Jesus was but a far off thing in my life. And maybe you want to take a moment this morning and just dedicate yourself to coming home. Maybe for the first time. You know, I think for, for young people, it's really important, especially if you are growing up with great families who bring you to church every Sunday. At some point, though, you do need to make your own decision of what it is that you want to make that faith your own. The, the confusing thing about faith is it, it's a very personal thing, but it should never be private. <laughs> we tend to make it private. Nothing in Scripture says make this private. Make sure nobody knows that you've made this decision. But in the space of that, if that's you, man, I would love to pray with you after the service. If you would want to walk up and say, hey, Jason, I don't know you, but here's the deal. I don't think I know Jesus either. Would you pray that I would accept him and see him? Secondly, and probably more prominently in a room like this, some of us have to lay down the labor tools and come into the house. Stop striving. Think about the blessings in Matthew 5. Blessed are those who work all the time. For theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who work their fingers to the bone and are, and are completely overwhelmed by their situations because theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. No. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are humble and suffer. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. See? It's there. It's right there. 
and in the most beautiful, beautiful way, Jesus shares it with those sinners and the saints. May it be something for you. May it be something that spurs you on, not for more work, but to get into the house and be with him. Let's pray. Father, I'm so glad that this parable exists as part of your will. <laughs> I am overwhelmed by the instance that you would take me, whether I was the younger brother or the older brother, caught up in striving. That you would take me on similarly. Lord, once again, thank you. Just in my own personal life, again, hearing this story has just brought me into a deeper space and a deeper dive into who you are, loving you all the more, wanting to be with you all the more. Forgive me for those spaces where I have decided to go out and do my own thing with the money that you gave me or that I've worked in the backyard thinking that my life is all about earning an opportunity with you. But it is not. Forgive me, God. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room that would say, man, this Jesus is not the Jesus I know. This understanding of salvation is not the one that I have. God, would you come in a mighty way, send your spirit to go ahead and to push people into those spaces to desire that and long for it and make it known. And for those of us workers that are tired and are demanding something that we probably shouldn't demand, may we also lay down our devices and our tools and be with you. May we go into the house and we be long in coming home.
We pray for us again. Lord, go with us. Go in front of us. Go behind us. Go on either side. May this kingdom of God this week become more and more evident as if it was something that we just couldn't see and now do. May it be something that we find our being in, our location in. And may we see you there. It's in your great name we pray all of these things. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Amen.